born again for you. On this day that many celebrate love, we are reminded that we love because he first loved us. First uh, John 4, 9 reminds us in this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And so today we're reminded that we love because he first loved us. If you're our guest here with us this morning, we uh, welcome you. We thank you for worshiping with us. We ask that you would please let us know a little bit about you by simply texting the word welcome to 803-590-1975. That would really help us get to know you a little bit, connect with you, and see how we can best minister to you and your family. If you're joining us online as well, you can text the word hello to that same number, 803-590-1975. We would love to connect with you in that way. If you're interested in what's knowing what's going on in our fellowship, you can simply text the word Luke to that same number. You get digitally connected to what's going on around here. Next Sunday, we'll have our first quarterly family meeting of 2021, immediately following the worship service. We do ask that you please plan on sticking around and hearing about all that God is doing among us uh, as we have opportunity to love, serve, go in the days ahead. You're welcome to bring a snack with you, something that maybe will tie you over to lunch. Uh, we will get back to serving lunch uh, at those quarterly family meetings, but we're still wanting to be COVID compliant. So you're welcome to bring a little snack, something that's prepared beforehand. We have a few snacks kind of around that, that we welcome you to take uh, and enjoy, but uh, we do hope that you'll stick around uh, for that time together. Just a reminder that today we will be offering parents an alternative uh, for their children during the sermon portion of the service called Equip Kids Church. Uh, Pastor John will let you know when it's time to head out and over to the Family Life Center for age-appropriate worship activities. Parents, that is just a, a disclaimer that today's message is uh, a rather difficult subject and one that many children might not be prepared to receive and that you as parents might not be ready to have that discussion with your children. So we offer this alternative to you. You're not, you don't have to, uh, but parents, we want you to make you aware of that opportunity. Speaking of opportunity, you still have today, today's the last day to take an opportunity to join us in the Shield of Badge ministry uh, as we want to connect your county sheriff's deputies with prayer partners here at Eastview. You'll find the sign-up sheets on the back table uh, as you uh, go out. We hope that we'll have many uh, deputies in the department see the value of having prayer in their lives. Today, we uh, certainly are grateful for the opportunity to collect the items for the Palmetto Women's Center. We have the baskets in the back. Um, and so please take an opportunity, if you haven't already, to bring some of those items in. There's a list on the back table, again, that lets you know what needs to go in those baskets. So as we prepare to worship, uh, through song, may our love for God be evident to Him as we set our minds on things above, uh, declaring the goodness of our God. Let's worship together, church. Would you please stand as we sing, Good, Good Father. Searching for answers only. 
so that you guys can get checked in safely there if you're grade a visitor. Six, not grade six, grade six. Yes, ma'am, grade six. Yeah. And if you would, please watch this quick video about the Palmetto Women's Center. Good morning, church family. Jenny Ruth and I sure are missing being with you this morning. I have a very special opportunity to highlight for you this morning, so if you would, please take out your phone and get ready to set a reminder. This coming Wednesday, February 17th, at the Fountain Park in downtown Rock Hill, there will be a countywide prayer hour for our local pregnancy center, the Palmetto Women's Center. It will be to pray over our senators and congressmen, both in the state and countrywide. It will be to pray for the moms of our area. It will be to pray for the unborn and praying for the teenagers who are being trained right here by the center to reach out to other teens. Um, this will be a one-hour opportunity from noon to 1 p.m., again, February 17th at Fountain Park. You are all welcome to come and join in. Um, and we would love to see you there. Also, thank you for those of you already filling up the basket on the back table. We appreciate this opportunity to bless the mom um, and bless the center with added resources. Thank you for this way that you all are loving, serving, and going right here in our county. You're loved. See you next week. Well, the baskets are back there, as we mentioned. We have an opportunity to be the hands and feet of Christ in that way. And so I'm grateful that you already participated. I see the things back there. And we continue to want to bless uh, that center. Uh, today, obviously, if you're in here now, uh, you have a disclaimer. So you know that chapter 34 of the book of Genesis is a really, really hard chapter. I don't take it lightly that the material here is difficult to hear, and difficult to understand, and certainly difficult to see how God would use, how God could use such a hard thing to bring about his good. But today we call this message the hope and the horror. So as we pray in preparation for our receiving of the food of God's word today. I pray that where you are, uh, you would prepare your hearts to see the hope uh, in the midst of a really horrible situation. So would you join me uh, as I pray aloud? Would you be praying, praying that your heart would be prepared, uh, praying that as this goes out to who knows how many people over the internet that uh, whose lives may be in a horrible situation right now, uh, that they might know there's hope because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Would you pray that where you are as I pray that here? 
Father, this morning we recognize that your word is truth. You have given us this word in such a way that we might take it and receive it and see what kind of God you are. But we find in your word that you are a good father. We sung about that this morning. We rejoice in your goodness to us. Father, your love for us is amazing because there, there's no good in us apart from the work of Christ. We are guilty. So thank you for loving us. For the deep love that sent your son to the cross. Father, as we receive the food of this word, I pray that we would be prepared to engage our community with these difficult truths. Recognize that we're not a people who are afraid of the hard things in your word. We don't pretend to understand completely how, why you allow certain things to happen. We do humbly submit ourselves before you, recognizing that you are God and we are not. So this morning, take this difficult text, please, Father. And use, us, use it to help shape us. That we might be better equipped to minister to one another in here and outside of these walls. The world that looks around and, and isn't so shocked by the horror of sin anymore in many ways. Pray for those in our church family who are struggling financially today. I pray for those in our church family who are struggling with their health. Those who are afraid because of the virus, Lord, I pray that you would embrace them with the goodness of your love today. Father, on this day when the world speaks of love probably more than any other day, I pray for those who might feel unloved today. That they might know that you love them with an everlasting love. For those who are hurting today because they don't have a loved one either like they used to, or the memories of the past, bring despair to their soul. Would you be near to them as well? Father, we confess as the people of God who gather at 1430 Gordon Road as the fact that we have not loved as we should have loved. We confess that our love often falls short of speaking the truth. Our love often falls short of going the second mile for someone. I pray that you would show us how to really love one another as we love you. Because the only love we can have for one another comes from you. Help us to do that with grace and compassion. So that as we love one another in here, our community will know that they are loved by you. Thank you, Father. <coughs> Come now and move among us for the sake of Christ. His name we pray. Amen. So many of you are probably familiar with a children's tune that goes something like, Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. There's another line that says, Oh, be careful, little feet, where you walk. Oh, be careful, little feet, where you walk. For the Father up above is looking down in love. 
Oh, be careful, little feet, where you walk. So as you consider that tune, those little verses of that song would have been very helpful probably for Dinah, Jacob's daughter, to have considered before she left the protection of her family's tent and started wandering around in Shechem. Big picture of the text today, she and her family had no business being in Shechem. This was not where God had planned for them to be. If you remember from last week, Jacob made a decision to settle down in the land outside the city of Shechem. We're clear on his intentions because he bought land and he built an altar there. So we can't give them a little bit of, oh, well, he must not have known what he was doing, or he didn't really mean to settle there. Yes, he did. He bought property and built an altar. And he said, you know, this, this can be my home. It was a compromise. Besides, it was only about a day's journey to Bethel. So I mean, that's how, that's how close he was. Let's not miss that he was just less than a day's journey from total obedience. But as he's there, he found himself really satisfied with the lucrative trade route that Shechem was on. It made sense economically to him to be right here, planted at this crossroad. What's the harm, Jacob pondered? Things in Bethel really couldn't be much better than this, could they? And I started wondering, asking myself, how often do I compromise with God? The conversations usually start out like this. God, I know you said this, but. God, I know I'm supposed to be discipling someone, but. I don't have the time right now. I wouldn't know what to say. Isn't that what we pay Pastor Chris and Pastor John for? God, I know I shouldn't date this person because they don't have a relationship with you, but they're really cute. I love them. God, I know I shouldn't post or repost this, but it's just too funny not to. God, I know I need to read my Bible more, but it's boring. It doesn't really relate to my life. You see how those things, those compromises, totally disrespect God. It's claiming, it's making the assertion that God doesn't really see or he doesn't care that if he were really a good God, and we've sung about this morning, he'd recognize that this is who I am, and this is what I do, and this is what I will do, and he'll just love me anyway. Friend, God accepts no compromise. His commands are not up for debate or discussion. All of his ways are right, and they lead to life. So Jacob was trying to compromise with God. Hey God, I know you told me to go to Bethel, but... Shechem sure seems like a good place to raise a family. Compromise is essentially a form of partial obedience, a method of attempting to bend God's commands and is unquestionably disobedience. We talked about this last week. Partial obedience is disobedience. God said, Jacob, go to Bethel. But in Jacob's compromise, there were great consequences, as would be the truth for us as well. For Jacob, there were absolutely horrible consequences as the covenant of God was in jeopardy due to rape, treachery, and genocide. So here's what I want us to walk out of this room today with. I want you to sit around talking about this this week, whether you're sitting at your family dinner table or whether you're riding in the car, or whether you're walking in your neighborhood. I want you to consider these things. There's hope in the horror. I just mentioned three terribly horrible things. But there's hope in the horror. How can we say that? Because the purposes of God will not be undone. If God is for us, who can be against us? Now, I can't know all the particular horrors that you're struggling with today. I know some of them. You've shared them with me. But I don't know all of them. But I pray that the Spirit will show you from this text how God works in the midst of a very, very dark chapter. So dark that the name of God isn't even mentioned in the whole chapter. So if you have your copy of God's Word, we're going to walk through it. We're not going to read it all in one sitting. We're going to walk through it section by section today to make sure we don't grasp 
what God wants us uh, just in these different sections. It might be easier to take in instead of just reading it all through at once. So Genesis chapter 34, and we'll start with verse 1. Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had born to Jacob. Right, so there's, there's, Moses is taking great pains here. There's great purposeful intention not to mention that Dinah is Jacob's daughter directly. I'll explain that more in a moment, but I don't want you to miss it here. Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had born to Jacob, went out to see the women of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, the prince of the land, saw her, he seized her and lay with her and humiliated her. And his soul was drawn to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. Now we see that text, that phrase. He loved the young woman and spoke tenderly to her. So Shechem spoke to his father Hamor, saying, Get me this girl for my wife. So Moses painting that purposeful picture of not wanting to connect Dinah to Jacob directly is supposed to help us see this picture of this lack of interest that Jacob has in the daughter of his unloved wife. Now we've already seen some of Jacob's favoritism among his wives and children. Remember last week when he was preparing them to meet Esau, he ordered them up sort of in his, his, his way of importance. So he put the ones that he loved the most in the back so that at least if the others got knocked out, they would still have his favorite. And that's going to pay awful consequences later. You'll see that in the rest of Genesis. So Dinah, she goes out to see the women of the land. She goes out to investigate their culture. The women weren't like those that she had been raised around, and her curiosity got the best of her as she wanted to expand her horizon. Girls of marriable age were not permitted to leave the tents of their people to go about visiting without a chaperone. In fact, the Hebrew term went out bears a sense of impropriety. Now, I need to make a disclaimer right here. Please note, I am in no way saying that she deserved to be raped. I want you to hear that. That's not where I'm going with this. She did not deserve it. In an era of the, uh, in the, era of the Me Too movement, I know there are many who think that men in leadership are okay with treating women like property and abusing them sexually as a sign of true masculine power. That is not what I'm communicating when I'm talking about this. As an image bearer of God, there's absolutely nothing okay with Dinah or any other woman being violated in this way. What I am saying is that Dinah likely went out behind Leah's back and suffered the terrible consequences of a violent rape. So as Dinah went out to see Shechem, who was the prince of the land, used his eyes to see her, and then he seized her and raped her. Moses purposefully uses the combination of words, saw, took. Now, if you're uh, thinking that you've heard those words before, you'd be right. We find those two words used to describe Eve's actions in the garden as she was confronted by Satan's lies and chose to believe them instead of the believing and trusting in the loving care that God was providing. And beside her, Adam was silently approving of her decision. The Bible says she saw the fruit, she took it, and ate it, and gave some to her husband, and immediately, Adam and Eve knew their disobedience changed everything. They were now banished from the garden, could no longer access the tree of life, thus they were going to have to work the earth and ultimately were going to return to the earth in their death. But God delighted in his creation. He delighted in man and woman, and he desired to initiate a rescue plan that would restore the relationship that was broken in the garden. We know that rescue plan meant offering his own son on the cross to take our place. So there was hope in the midst of the horror of the fall through Jesus' death. 
burial, and resurrection. And there's hope in the midst of the darkness done to Dinah as well. We'll get there. But before we do, there's two truths we shouldn't miss right here. Number one, sin always acts like sin. Sin always acts like sin. Let me explain. When you define sin, you can define it this way. It's any failure to conform to the moral law of God in act, attitude, or nature. So at its core, sin is unbelief. We don't trust what God says. It's making us God, saying we can have what we want when we want it. When sin entered the world, it was because Adam and Eve didn't trust the word of God and instead trusted the words of a sneaky serpent. Shechem's desire to have a wife wasn't a problem. That desire was ordered in creation, but getting it his way was the problem. His way involved the desecration of an image bearer of God. And that was sin. So sin's always going to act like sin. It's always going to be a failure to conform to the moral act of God in act, attitude, or nature. Now, second truth I want us to see right here is that the horror of sin often begins with the eyes. The horror of sin often begins with the eyes. He saw the fruit. Just a few chapters later, the sons of God saw the fruit the daughters of men, and took as many as they wanted. Ham, the father of the people group that Jacob is living among in this chapter. Okay, so Ham's the father of the Canaanites. And so Ham saw his naked father, and he went out and bragged about it. And a curse was put on his entire people group. Those are the people that Jacob's living among right here in chapter. The spies, when they went to check out the promised land, they saw the people of the land. And to them, they looked like giants and they looked like little grasshoppers. And in their rebellion, they went back to the people and said, oh, no, we can't go there. They faced the discipline of God. King David saw Bathsheba out bathing and committed adultery with her in his heart. Then he took her and he lay with her and he murdered her husband. So we must ask ourselves, friends, what are our eyes fixed on? Jesus tells us in his sermon, Matthew 6, 22 through 23, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. One whose eyes are good looks to God as their master, trusting in him unwaveringly, and they are filled with the light of God's will. We know how to pray, we know what to do, and we can rest in God's perfect care. But if our eyes are bad, and we're simply looking to the treasures of this world to satisfy us, you'll only find the darkness of pride and grief. What we let in with our eyes determines our entire lives. Here's a simple example. If you're teaching your child about a bike, or you're teaching your teenager how to drive a car, they have to keep their eyes fixed on what's ahead, or disaster is sure to come. In the same way, what our spiritual eyes are fixed on will determine our spiritual direction. And so we declare, oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Sin is always sin. And we often try to make a defense against it by saying things like, oh, don't be like Shechem. You know, we want to take a principle or application point from this text, and we're so quick to say, just don't be like Shechem. But the best way, church, to fight sin, because sin's always going to act like sin, the best way to, to fight against it is to confront it with truth. The truths related to dying in Shechem include that God's creation is good truth that every single male and female is created in God's image with dignity and worth. The truth that marriage is a gift. The truth that sex is a gift rightly used. So when Satan tempts us to use our eyes to sin, we must confront him with the truth of God's word and he will back off every time. 
Shechem's eyes saw only lust. And he thought that his father, Hamor, might be able to help seal the deal with Jacob, Dinah's father. And so he goes over and says, get me that girl for my wife. Let's pick up reading. Verse 5. Now Jacob heard that he had defiled his daughter, Dinah. But his sons were with his livestock in the field, so Jacob held his peace until they came. And Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. The sons of Jacob had come in from the field as soon as they heard of it, and the men were indignant and very angry because he had done an outrageous thing in Israel by lying to Jacob's daughter, for such a thing must not be done. But Hamor spoke with him, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him to be his wife. Make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us. Take our daughters for yourselves. You shall dwell with us, and the land shall be open to you. Dwell and trade in it, and get property in it. Shechem also said to her father and to her brother, so that was Hamor speaking. You know, he was trying to see the deal. Now Shechem, Shechem speaks up, speaks to the, her father and her brothers. Let me find favor in your eyes. Whatever you say to me, I'll give. Ask me for as great a bride price and gift as you will, and I'll give whatever you say to me. Only give me the young woman to be my wife. Now, we can't help but notice here Jacob's deference to his sons. This is strange. All along, we've seen Jacob as the manipulator. Jacob is the one who leads and negotiates situations to his advantage. Jacob, the deceiver. And now he's silent waiting for his sons to come in from the field before doing anything. Now, we need to understand something about the culture of the day. While it sounds disgusting to our ears, rape was often used in the ancient Near East in an effort to force a family into a marriage contract. A single woman having lost her purity was basically worthless and culturally left out, rejected by family, and often remained poor and without honor for the rest of her life. So Shechem at least had the dignity to want to marry her as a form of protection. He said, I'll take her as my wife, she'll be saved, all is well, right? Just let her come into my home and we'll all, we'll all be good. And so Jacob right here is caught between what we call the proverbial rock and the hard place. He's enjoying the land. He really likes being there. He didn't really care for Dinah anyway. So what's the big deal? He's silent. He's thinking about this. That apathy, you can only imagine, helped fuel the fury in his sons as they came in from the field. But notice the boys did have a sense that this crime was against uh, their entire nation. So what had happened to their sister was a crime that didn't just happen to her. It happened to all of them. But Hamor and Shechem were persistent. They presented what they believed to be a very generous offer, even withholding the information that Dinah was in Shechem's house, potentially as a captive. Their offer to let bygones be bygones and become one big happy family, something that Israel never could do, it sure seemed enticing at the moment. You're already in the land, they're saying. Let's, let's just open up a free trade agreement and my land will be your land. We'll swap daughters. Everything will be just fine. Jacob's already made a deal about the land. Genesis 33 says he bought some property there. It just seems natural to go ahead and make it even sweeter by working out a marriage deal. Never mind that Abraham said don't mess with the Canaanites. Never mind that Isaac said, don't marry a Canaanite. Never mind that Esau married Canaanites and made life for Isaac and Rebekah bitter. If Jacob was to approve this marriage contract, Israel would become one with the Canaanites. Jacob was the smaller clan and would basically have become absorbed by them. If approved, Jacob would become like a second lot who settled down in Sodom and intermingled with the people and became corrupted like them. Hamor describes it in verse 22 as becoming one people. The last time that designation, one people, was used was at the Tower of Babel in chapter 11. And we know how that ended. If this deal 
when Hamor and Shechem went through, it would have meant the destruction of God's covenant people. See, chapter 34 is a really big deal for a lot of reasons, but this would probably be the biggest deal. It was a direct threat to God's salvation plan, attacking God's good purposes to send a Messiah. The covenant right here is in jeopardy, and all the promises made to Jacob sure do sound similar to what God offered Jacob in the promised land. And so it would be real easy for Jacob to just say, you know what, I'm already here, I love being on this trade route, I'll, sure, let's just let our daughters marry and our sons marry. Shortcutting God's plan. The people who first heard this, the Israelites, as Moses was writing for them, wanted them to get this tension. Like, oh wow, our nation was, was about to be swallowed up by these people. What's going to happen? So I want us to see in, in this next truth that the enemy will tempt us to shortcut God's plan. The enemy will tempt us, you and I, to shortcut God's plan. That's what he did to Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. If he's willing to try to tempt the Son of God to shortcut God's plan, don't you know he'll come after us and try to cause us to shortcut God's plan. Friends, there are no shortcuts in our sanctification. Matthew 7, we've talked about this many times. Matthew 7, 13 and 14 says, Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. The narrow and hard way to life offers no opportunity to shortcut God's plan. Shortcuts in our sanctification often look like making things seem all about us, that we would become more holy if everything just went our way, that everything should revolve around my likes, my habits, my comforts, my ways of serving. True sanctification, church, is laying down our lives for others. Shortcuts take the glory off of God, which is just what the enemy wants. It's what he wants you to do. It's what he wants me to do. Steal the glory from him. And it looks like Satan would win. I take the glory off of God and put it on myself. Humble submission glorifies God. For as we said last week, the way up is down. Don't settle, church. Please, let's not settle for Satan's gimmicky attempts at getting around what God has declared. Shortcuts offer opportunities for spiritual disaster. Well, as we get back in our text, the tension now is really thick with wonder. What's Jacob going to do? Is he going to give in to the offer of Hamor and Shechem? Well, the sons of Jacob had their own plan. Let's pick up in verse 13. The sons of Jacob answered Shechem. Notice it's the boys who answer, not Jacob. Sons of Jacob answered Shechem and his father Hamor deceitfully. This is a little commentary Moses has given us so that we know that what they're getting ready to say wasn't really their thought because he had defiled their sister Dinah. They said to them, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised for that would be a disgrace to us. Only on this condition will we agree with you. You'll become as we are by every male among you being circumcised. Then we'll give our daughters to you and we will take your daughters to ourselves and we'll dwell with you and become one people. But if you will not listen to us and be circumcised, then we'll take our daughter and we will be gone. Well, their words pleased Hamor and Hamor's son Shechem. The young man didn't delay to do the thing because he delighted in Jacob's daughter. He was the most honored of all his father's house, so Hamor and his son Shechem came to the gate of their city. That's where he did the business of the town. And he spoke to the men of the city, saying, These men are at peace with us. Let them dwell in the land and trade in it. Behold, the land's large enough for them. Let us take their daughters as wives and let us give them our daughters. Only on this condition will the men agree to dwell with us to become one people. When every male among us is circumcised as they are circumcised. Will not their livestock, their property, and all their beasts be ours? Only let us agree with them and they'll dwell with us. All 
often went out of the gate of his city, listened to Hamor and his son Shechem, and every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of his city. Well, we've moved from one terrible wrong to another. The sons deceitfully propose that they'll go along with this plan of intermarriage if all the men of the town would be circumcised. Now, this is a terrible desecration of the abuse of the holy rite of circumcision. What God meant for the Israelites to be a symbol of faith was being turned into a tool for gaining revenge. What God meant for good, the enemy was trying to use for evil. Well, the plan actually seemed reasonable to Shechem because pagan cultures often viewed circumcision as an initiation into marriage. So as they looked at the men of Israel, they said, well, it's normal for them. If they then reasoned, it must not be such a bad thing. For Shechem, the pain was temporary, while the hope of gaining Dinah would be for a lifetime. He was just going to have to get the men of the town to the group. And sign on to the deal. You know what his tactic was? Convince them of the economic opportunity. Nothing about pain, nothing about any of that, just completely look, everything they have will be ours. Notice they didn't say the, uh, that, that we will share everything. Notice there's a, a complete idea here that, that the, the brothers fear that Israel was going to be disgraced. The big picture that we're on the edge of the potential of the Jacob's sons being absorbed by this people is clearly spoken right here. Everything they have will be ours. It's not about the we here. It's all about the us. The men had no problem with this. Their gain seemed worth the pain, but they had no idea what was coming. Look at verse 25. On the third day, when they were sore, two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon, and Levi, Dinah's brothers, took their swords and came against the city while it felt secure and killed all the males. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the sword and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went away. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their flocks and their herds, their donkeys, and whatever was in the city and in the field, all their wealth, all their little ones, and their wives, all that was in the houses, they captured and plundered. Dinah's two older brothers led the raid. They took their swords out and went on a genocidal killing spree. All the males were killed, including Hamor and Shechem. Dinah's rescued, and then look what happens. The sons of Jacob rush in like vultures and plunder the entire city. Everyone is affected by this horrible incident. No one was righteous. No, not one. Even Jacob, when he heard about the incident, he was only put out about it because of what it meant for him. Look at verse 30. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you brought trouble on me by making me stink to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My numbers are few. If they gather themselves against me and attack me, I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. To which the brothers replied in verse 31, should he treat our sister like a prostitute? Still for Jacob, me, 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 me. The boy said, but what about Dinah? What a horrible mess. Terrible mess. The cries of the women and the children who just lost their husbands and their dads are watching their stuff get plundered. That's being joined in with the sight of Jacob's own sons covered in blood for the sake of revenge. Where's the hope in this horror, you ask? Well, God used the evil actions of Simeon and Levi to keep a marriage deal from happening between Israel and Canaan. The covenant of God was kept safe once again. Now, don't misunderstand me. Simeon and Levi's actions were a terrible evil. Jacob even pronounces on them an anti-blessing as he's about to die. We don't have times in Genesis 49 to look at it. His blessing, obviously, we'll get there when we finish this book. 
When Peter pulls out the sword, when the, uh, when the folks are coming, the guards are coming to get Jesus, she said, put away your sword, Peter. Not time for that. Heals the man's ear. Those who kill by the sword die by the sword, Jesus said. I'm not saying that what Simeon and Levi did was right. But God used what Simeon and Levi did to work out his ultimate good. Leading to our final truth today, God's covenant promises will not be undone. You see, God's faithfulness to his promises. We've been talking about this for, the, for this whole section of Genesis. But here we are again. God's covenant promises will not be undone. God wants to bless, not to curse. So even in the moments of dark, dark, dark human sin, when God seems to be nowhere in sight, he's not even mentioned in this chapter, God's purposes will not be overthrown. In God's providence, God uses the horrible actions of Simeon and Levi to accomplish something in line with his will, protecting the Israelites from being assimilated into the nation of the Canaanites. I recognize this may be a hard teaching for you because we often think of God's providence as something good that happens to us. But here, and as we'll see further along in Genesis, God's providence often operates in the context of man's sinful behavior. I appreciate how commentator John Walton further explains this. Listen to what he says. If God can only work through godly behavior, there is little he can do in our sinful world. He does not, of course, guide Jacob's sons to act as they do. His sovereignty in these cases is demonstrated not by overriding the free, wicked choices that people make, but by dovetailing those acts of wickedness into his own plan. Friends, there's no human atrocity that has escaped God's notice and that he won't use to accomplish his plan. So in the horror, there's grace. There's hope in the horror of this incident because it helps us believe, friends, that the Bible is real. When people all over the land today are trying to erase the atrocities of the past and pretend that awful things didn't happen in the past, it calls into question the validity of history. Moses could have just left this incident out. Nothing about God in here. Terrible rape. The desecration of circumcision is a holy symbol and genocide. But having it here, leaving it in this text, shows us that the Bible is not afraid of the hard topics. We learn that even in the midst of the worst of situations, there's hope because God is faithful. God will use all things to accomplish his purposes. If God can use the events of Genesis 34 for ultimate good, he can use whatever we encounter in our lives, no matter how horrible, to accomplish his plan. All of this would have been avoidable if Jacob had just completely obeyed. If Jacob had just gone to Bethel like he'd been instructed, the rape, the deceit, the genocide were all consequences of his disobedience, and he could only see himself and his sons in their deceitful ways. Where do you think they got it? They watched the deceitful ways of their daddy. But friends, Jacob's only hope is our same hope as well. There's hope in the horror because Christ, the ultimate son of Jacob, the ultimate Israel, took upon himself the greater wickedness than any human can experience. His death at the hand of sinners was eternally unjust because he was without any sin. There's hope in the horror of our future judgment because while even we are sinners, while our sin was heaped up on Christ, he died for us and offered us life if we will repent and believe. And so we can sing at the end of our time together today, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it like a snow. Father, I thank you for these difficult texts. And I pray that we would capture the truths that you want us to capture from this word. I thank you that you use even the horror 
of rape and deceit and genocide to ultimately accomplish your purposes because nothing will stop you. And so the wicked acts of men cannot undo your purposes. And for that, we rejoice today. God, for the one who may be here today or watching online and, and wondering whether their past, their horrible past in their mind, could separate them from your love. I pray today that they would see in Genesis chapter 34 that nothing can separate them from the love of Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for paying it all. We continue to worship you today. In spirit and in truth, as the people of God, with one voice say, Amen. Let it be so. Church family, would you stand as we respond to the word of God? Declare from Genesis 34, the hope of Christ who paid it all. If you're here today and wondering what, what all this Christ talk is about, I'd love to tell you more about what it means to follow the God who loves you with an everlasting love. If you're not comfortable with coming up here, that's okay. There are folks right here in this room who love to talk to you about what it means to follow Christ. If you're online or even if you're here, you can text the word TALK to 803-590-1975. We'll start the conversation. What does it mean to follow God? His covenant promises will never be undone. Let's respond, church. Jesus paid it all. I hear the Savior sing. Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch it. Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, 
to redeem us from all lawlessness, and to purify us for himself, a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. Love, serve, and go. If you do have a child, please go pick them up in the family. <laughs>